This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 17, for broadcast on the 7th of February, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, confirmation of an ancient lake on Mars builds more excitement for the Perseverance rover's sample returns, a strange new type of hypothetical celestial object that might just be real. And Rocket Lab starts off what's promising to be a busy new year with a successful booster recovery. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. If life ever existed on the Red Planet, NASA's Mars Perseverance rover's verification of lake sediments at the base of Jezero Crater reinforces the hope that traces of ancient organisms might well be found there. A report of the journal Science Advances shows that at some point the crater did fill with water, depositing layers of sediment on the crater floor. Now the lake ultimately shrank and the sediments carried downstream by a river that fed it ultimately formed an enormous delta. As the lake dissipated over time, the sediments in the crater were eroded, forming the geologic features visible on the surface today. The study's lead author, David Page from the University of California, Los Angeles, says that from orbit, we can see a bunch of different deposits, but we can't tell for sure if what we're seeing is their original state, or if we're actually seeing the conclusion of a long geological story. Page says to tell how these things formed, we need to see below the surface. And that's where the Kasai six-wheeled Mars Perseverance rover comes in. It carries seven scientific instruments which have been exploring the 50-kilometre-wide crater, studying its geology and atmosphere and collecting samples ever since its arrival on Mars back in 2021. It's hoped that Perseverance's rock and soil samples will eventually be brought back to Earth by a future sample return mission. That's currently slated for sometime between 2029 and 2030 as a joint US-European endeavour. Once safely in the big laboratories on Earth, these samples will be carefully studied for evidence of past Martian life. It's been a busy time for Perseverance. Between May and December 2022, the rover drove from the crater floor up onto the delta itself, a vast expanse of three billion-year-old sediments that, from orbit at least, resembles river deltas seen on Earth. As the rover drove onto the delta, Perseverance's radar imager fired radar waves downwards at 10 centimetre intervals. In the process, it measured pulses being reflected back from depths of around 20 metres below the surface. With the radar, scientists can see down to the base of the sediments, revealing the top surface of the buried crater floor. Years of research with ground-penetrating radar and testing of Perseverance's radar imager on Earth have taught scientists how to read the structure and composition of the subsurface layers from their radar reflections. The resulting subsurface images show rock layers that can be interpreted like a highway road cut. The crater floor below the data isn't uniformly flat. That suggests a period of erosion occurred prior to the deposition of lake sediments. The radar images also show these sediments are regular and horizontal, just like sediments deposited in lakes here on Earth. The existence of lake sediments has been suspected from previous studies, but this is now being confirmed by this new research. A second period of deposition occurred when fluctuations in the lake level allowed the river to deposit a broad delta that once extended far out into the lake, but has now been eroded back closer to the river's mouth. Page says the changes we see preserved in the rock record are being driven by large-scale changes in the Martian environment. This is space time. Still to come, a strange new type of hypothetical celestial object that just might be real. And Rocket Lab starts off a busy year in New Zealand with a successful booster recovery. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break in our program for a word from our sponsor, Incogni. As you know, we take internet security very seriously, and Incogni is a guardian in the digital age. 
Have you ever worried about the extensive list of personal details about you and your family that are currently floating around online? Those concerns aren't unfounded. Take, for example, people's search sites. These are sites in the dark web that collect and display vast amounts of personal data from public records to social media, usually without consent. That data is then on sold to bad guys who'll use it to try and exploit you and your family. This sort of exposure quickly leads to privacy breaches, identity theft, scams, unwanted personal contact. Like me, you've probably been inundated with spam emails and wondered where they got those details from. Well, people's search sites are probably to blame. And that's just one small example. And here's where Incogni steps in. Not only does Incogni advocate for your right to privacy by engaging data brokers to delete your personal information, it also tackles the risks associated with people's search sites. The process of manually trying to remove your data from these sites is daunting and never-ending as new records constantly emerge. In light of these concerns, Incogni emerges as your ally, working hard to ensure not just that your information is removed, but that it stays removed. And this continuous effort significantly lowers your chances of spams, scams, and identity theft. And right now, as a loyal space-time listener, we're offering an exclusive 60% discount on Incogni subscriptions. So, don't let your personal information become a commodity. Visit incogni.com slash Stuart Garrett to secure this exclusive offer and safeguard your privacy. Remember, that's incogni, I-N-C-O-G-N-I. And the URL again, incogni.com slash Stuart Gary. And of course, we'll include the details in the show notes and on our website. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time. Space Time. With Stuart Gary. One of the more fascinating celestial objects theorized but yet to be discovered is the hypothetical Synestia, and the search continues to try and find them. Planetary scientists Simon Locke from Harvard University and Sarah Stewart from the University of California, Davis, described the Synestia as a huge spinning donut shaped mass of hot vaporized rock formed as planet sized objects crash into each other. And Stewart says that at some point early in its history, the Earth itself was likely a Synestia. Their study, which was reported in the Journal of Geophysical Research Planets, looked at how planets can form from a series of giant impacts. Now, current theories of planet formation hold that rocky planets such as the Earth, Mars and Venus formed early in the existence of our solar system around 4.6 billion years ago. Initially, it was coalescing gas and dust. Then, as these things built up, small grains, rocks and pebbles started to come along. That accretion process continued until full-sized planets, like the Earth today, were the result. Now, these collisions, especially the big ones, can be so violent that the resulting bodies are melted and partially vaporised, eventually cooling and solidifying into the roughly spherical planets we see today. Locke and Stewart were especially interested in collisions between spinning objects, See, a rotating object has angular momentum, and this needs to be considered in a collision. I guess it's sort of like a skater spinning on ice. If the skater extends their arms, it'll slow their rate of spin. And if they want to spin faster, they hold their arms close to their body. But throughout this process, the angular momentum remains the same. Now, consider two skaters turning on ice. If they catch hold of each other, the angular momentum of each adds together, so their total angular momentum must be the same. Locke and Stewart modelled what happens when the ice skaters are instead Earth-sized rocky planets colliding with these large objects having both high energy and high angular momentum. The authors found that over a range of high temperatures and high angular momentum, planet-sized bodies could form a new much larger structure, an indented disk, much like a red blood cell or a donut with a centre filled in. This object would be mostly vaporised rock with no liquid or solid surface. They've decided to name this new object from Sin, meaning together, and Hestia, the Greek goddess of architecture and structures. The key to a synestia's formation would be that some of the structure's material needs to actually go into orbit. See, in a spinning solid sphere, every point from the core to the surface is rotating at the same rate. But in a giant impact, the material of the planet can become molten or gaseous and expand in volume. Now, if the object gets big enough and is moving fast enough, parts of the object pass the velocity needed to keep a satellite in orbit. 
and that when it forms a huge disc-shaped synestia. Now, previous theories have suggested that giant impacts might cause planets to form a disk of solid or molten material surrounding the planet. But for the same massive planet, a synestia would be much larger than a solid planet with a disk. Stewart says most planets likely experience collisions that could form a synestia at some point during formation. For an object like the Earth, a synestia wouldn't last a long time, perhaps just a hundred years or so, before it lost enough heat to condense back into a solid object. But synestias formed from larger, hotter objects such as gas giants or stars could potentially last much longer. And when you think about it, the synestia structure also offers new ways to think about how the moon was formed. Earth's moon is remarkably similar to the Earth in composition. And most current theories about how the moon formed involved the giant impact theory, where around four and a half billion years ago, there was a massive collision between the early proto-Earth and a small Mars-sized object about a third the size of the Earth, which scientists have dubbed Thea. This impact would have melted both bodies into a giant magma ocean, and some of this material was ejected into space, eventually orbiting around the body and cooling and accreting to form the moon. But the authors say such an impact could have instead formed the synestia in which the Earth and Moon both condensed. Problem is, no one's yet observed the synestia directly, but they might be found in other solar systems. We've just got to keep looking. Planetary scientist Simon O'Toole, who wasn't involved in the study, says it's an interesting idea and a new type of planetary object to look for. So basically it's this kind of body that you get immediately after the collision between two planets, as we currently understand them, two planet-sized objects. So part of this is driven by the formation, how did the Earth's moon form? The basic idea is that you had two planetary-sized objects that collided. And they, they've done some theoretical calculations where they've done all these. They've basically collided two planetary mass objects together and just to see what would happen. And one of the outcomes seems to be that you get, rather than getting two, an Earth and a moon like we have, is you, you get sort of this very large donut of hot vaporised rock that is sort of spinning around a very, very, very large, much bigger than, say, the actual two planets because you, you've got this it's vaporised rock in a sort of a... An astronomers would probably call it a torus, uh, yeah. which is really a fancy name for, for a donut. And you'd have some central region which was more dense and then this vaporised sort of this cloud of material going around in a donut shape around the outside. And it probably doesn't have a very long lifespan, probably only hundreds, the order of hundreds of years, before it either disperses away into space or condenses in something like the moon. So it sort of fits in a little bit with the trans, like you could imagine as a transition period between two Earth-sized planets and an Earth and a moon. You know, angular momentum uh, is the key here, and, and in, in these sorts of situations, we don't really understand angular momentum very well, in my opinion. So it's very, it's a very, very interesting idea, um, this Synestia idea. I'm not really keen on the name Synestia, but, um, you know, that it is what it is. But I, I, I like the concept that it could happen. The one key part here is this is very, very theoretical. No one has observed anything that looks like this, and that's in part because it's very, very difficult because the scale here is still only a little bit larger than a planet, maybe out to the orbit of the moon or, or a bit beyond. So it's very, very difficult to observe this kind of thing. Is the Synestia really just a fat ring? Well, I'd say that the uh, the rings are more likely the debris left over from the formation of the planet's moon. So the planet itself formed at the centre and then there's a whole lot of other material around the outside and then it gradually accreted into the various moons and then there were any sort of leftover material went into the rings. Although, of course, Saturn is a little bit different because it's, in fact, fed uh, a geyser from one of its moons. And so the, the yeah. rings are con continuously being renewed, but certainly, yeah, I think that any ring structure is quite different to this because there, even if you had a collision, although I think when we've looked at comets and that sort of thing that have collided into Jupiter, run, run into Jupiter, they've basically been just destroyed completely. But that's because you have a very large thing with a very, very small thing, whereas in this scenario you're looking at earth-sized objects you're looking at something like mars and something like earth that sort of ballpark colliding and so the and they're very rocky so the i think that has a big impact on the outcome so this really means that the existence of a synestia would depend very much upon which eventual model of planetary formation turns out to be correct yeah it does 
It does. I mean, I, I sort of feel like uh, the, the various models of planet formation probably occur just depends on their initial conditions. <laughs> so that's a hunch. I wouldn't call that a, you know, backed up by anything, but my hunch is that they, they, they both will work in the right scenario. The two models are planetary accretion model uh, is basically where the star forms at the centre of a very large cloud of gas uh, and any other material, rock, whatever, and it forms the, you have this very large collapse of material and then you get the nuclear ignition, same your star, and then any material left over starts rotating around that star, starts orbiting it, and then eventually you get little impacts and collisions, but the, the bits of material there, the rock and gas and ice and whatever, collide and stick together and gradually accrete, become larger and larger, and they and as they become larger, they attract more material, and so they eventually become what you, what you would call planetesimals, so or a small planet, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the case of gas giants, the idea is you might have some dense core of material, but then you get gas that just gets sort of drawn to it and accretes onto that. In the case of the terrestrial planets, the rocky planets, it's just rock and, and maybe ice and that kind of thing, but the ice is obviously going to be vaporised. and So you just have this molten thing because as they collide, as all of the bits and pieces collide, they get very, very hot. And so that sort of does feed into this Sinestia idea in the sense that you have these two hot things that collide and then they spew out this large amount of hot vaporised rock. The other model is the gravitational instability model of planet formation and that's much more where rather than the accretion you, you have it's a, it forms uh, it's a little bit more like star formation you, you get regions of high density that sort of collapse in on themselves and and I think that I mean, my personal once again it's more a hunch but I think that that might match brown dwarfs a little bit better. It does, yeah. The latest evidence we're getting from jets coming out of brown dwarfs, almost a, a light year yeah. long, indicate that the uh, yeah. that, that model may well be correct. At least for brown dwarfs, which, which sort of fill that gap between the largest planets and the smaller stars. Yeah, and so and that actually changes our ideas of our brown, our, you know, is something like Jupiter a, a failed star or a failed brown dwarf? Because it, if it formed through an accretion mechanism rather than gravitational instability, then it's probably more just a large, a very large planet, whereas a brown dwarf that formed potentially by the gravitational instability is much more like a failed star. That's Dr Simon O'Toole from Macquarie University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, Rocket Lab starts off what looks like a busy year with a successful booster recovery. And later in the science report, a computer-human interface chip has been successfully planted in a human volunteer's brain. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Rocket Lab has started the new year off with a successful electron launch and booster recovery. The four-of-its-kind mission was launched from Rocket Lab's Launch Complex 1 on the Mahaya Peninsula of New Zealand's North Island. On board the 18-metre-tall launcher were four situational awareness satellites for Spy Global. They're designed to monitor what's an increasingly congested area of near-Earth space from a 530-kilometre-high orbit. Because on internal power. They have to use the screen and enable the flight. Stage one and stage two tanks are pressed for flight. I've blown engine purge is enabled. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and we have liftoff. Electron has successfully lifted off from Rocket Lab Launch Complex 1 with its Spire and North Star payload. The rocket is on its way to low Earth orbit with those four satellites on board. Now T plus 40 seconds into flight. Electron has begun its pitch over, moving up and on an angle to head away from the launch pad and out over the ocean. Now all is looking nominal so far as the rocket approaches max Q, the moment in ascent when Electron experiences the maximum amount of aerodynamic pressure. Electron is supersonic, approaching max Q. Q 
cleared Max Q. The rocket is now 16 kilometers in altitude and moving at over 2,000 kilometers an hour. Next up for Electron is Miko, our main engine cutoff, quickly followed by stage separation and the startup of the Rutherford engine on that second stage to continue the mission to orbit. And the nine engines of the first stage will throttle down and then shut off just before the first and second stages separate from each other. When that happens, the second stage with the Spire satellites will maintain its orbital trajectory and continue on with the mission, while the first stage of Electron will begin its reorientation maneuver to position itself for the return journey to Earth. Now these four events happen in quick succession and are coming up shortly. 15 seconds to staging. Entered burnout detect mode. Miko confirmed. That's confirmation stage of two, Miko, confirmed. stage staff, and Rutherford engine ignition on stage two. Stage two propulsion nominal. Fairing jettison succeeded. That was the call for fairing jettison on the second stage. That means Electron's nose cone has successfully split apart and fallen away. And we do this in preparation for deploying the kick stage with its satellites and to get rid of the dead weight of the fairing now that we are through Earth's atmosphere. Electron's stage one trajectory is on its way to the highest point of its momentum arc. And once it reaches this apogee, the stage's trajectory line should start to come down as its altitude begins to drop too. That movement of the booster as it redirects to come back to Earth bottom heavy. That way, the engines bear the brunt of the re-entry forces rather than shredding the carbon composite at the top of the stage. The stage will move quickly as it is pulled back to Earth by gravity and at its peak, the first stage will reach around eight times the speed of sound and generate so much friction that we could see a red-orange glow from the heat as it descends. It is TP plus four minutes and 33 seconds into the mission and Electron's second stage carrying today's payloads remains on course for payload deployment within the hour. Now that second stage is clocking speeds at more than 10,000 kilometers an hour, having now passed 174 kilometers in altitude. For Electron's first stage on its return journey back to Earth, we have had the stage reach its apogee, flip into its atmosphere re-entry position and begin dropping in altitude as it speeds up on its homeward bound trajectory. It will travel this way for a few minutes before its drogue and main parachutes are deployed to help slow it down. A little different than what you're used to from our previous launches, but this is due to the implementation of BEAST, or our electrical arc suppression system, which ensures all electronics on board can function nominally. The addition of a nitrogen tank that maintains pressure within the stage. We're now listening to hear the call from Mission Control for battery hot swap. This hot swap maneuver will allow the continuous energy supply to the Rutherford engine's electric pumps, which deliver fuel to the engine's combustion chamber at extremely high pressure. Pressure. Hot swap successful. A good call from Mission Control. Electron's second stage has completed the battery hot swap. The second stage is maintaining its momentum at more than 15,000 kilometers an hour, now past 200 kilometers in altitude. And we are currently at T plus 6 minutes, 39 seconds into the mission, and the next critical milestone we are tracking is the deployment of the drogue chute on Electron's first stage. AFDS has saved. Confirm drogue deploy. We have the drogue parachute. It has been deployed from that first stage of Electron. We heard that call from Mission Control, so that seems like a nominal drogue chute deploy since we haven't heard anything different from our operators. That means we'll move next to the main parachute deploy, coming up in around 30 seconds. Main parachute deploy. HVB battery discharge holding nominal. Another great call out from Mission Control. The main parachute on Electron's first stage has successfully deployed. This means the booster's pace will have slowed down significantly significantly and should now be drifting gently towards the ocean. It's expected to take around 10 minutes for the booster to reach the water surface, but we'll keep the comms channels up for mission control to share updates as they come through. Enter burnout detect mode. Guidance is in terminal, 26 seconds remaining. Now back to the primary mission and we are coming up on the final few seconds of stage two engine burn. We will then have second engine cutoff or seco which shuts down the engine ahead of the kick stage separating for its phasing orbit of Earth. And we're listening out for those events now. Seco confirmed. Stage three separation confirmed. Great news from Mission Control with that second stage engine cold and the kick stage separated. We are now in the final stages of this four of a kind mission. The kick stage and Spire and North Star satellites are now in a coast phase around Earth. After that elliptical orbit of Earth is complete, then the kick stage's engine will light up to set the stage and the satellites on a circular orbit before payload deployment. The four of a kind mission was the 43rd launch of the Electron rocket, which has so far successfully placed 160. 76 satellites into orbit since their first flight back in 2017. 2024 looks like being a busy year for Rocket Lab. They've announced an ambitious launch schedule with more flights than any previous year. The impressive manifest includes launches from both New Zealand and the United States. 
Among the many payloads will be new packages for NASA, hypersonic technology tests, and block launches for satellite operators such as Black Sky, Synspective, and Kinus. In order to achieve its program, Rocket Lab wants to start recovering and refurbishing previously used rocket launches. Consequently, the Electron first stage booster used for the Four of a Kind mission was recovered from the sea by Rocket Lab following the core stage's parachute guided return to the surface and splashdown. The latest on recovery is that all is continuing as planned for Electron's first stage and its slow descent to the ocean. Our recovery crew are on standby in the recovery zone, waiting for that splashdown before they can move in and get to work. Confirms stage one splashdown. Electron's first stage has just successfully splashed down in the ocean after its return journey from space. The Electron recovery team are making their way to the stage in the water. They're about 10 minutes or so out. They'll complete safety checks and an initial assessment of the stage's condition before they attempt to bring it on deck of the recovery ship. Recovery vessel is inbound, approximately 12 minutes, and they have eyes on the stage in the water. We also have a solid telemetry feed from the stage as well. And a further update on stage one. Stage one altitude is zero and speed is also zero. And stage one is saved. Both tanks are depressurized. Recovery vessel still inbound. Recovery vessel is switching to retrieval operations. Preparation. Confirm visual on the stage and that it's floating well. Curie Cadler Cedar is scheduled to enable. And this is recovery. We have visual confirmation. The stage is intact and floating happily. And from here, our recovery team will hoist the stage on board the recovery vessel, ready for the trip back to our production facility. And maybe, just maybe, it might just get a second trip to space. AOS Spain. We have had a perfect mission so far to deliver today's payloads to a 530 kilometer low Earth orbit and smooth operations for electron recovery. AOS Azores. Electron cleared the pad at Launch Complex 1 at 1934 New Zealand local time and soared cleanly through its first launch milestones. That's Max Q, Miko, stage separation and second stage ignition. And shortly after that, the rocket completed a successful battery hot swap for its stage 2 engine before the Rutherford shutdown is planned for kick stage separation. Well, all of that was going on, we have of course had a secondary mission underway to bring Electron's first stage back to Earth from space. After a clean separation of the first stage after after Miko, the booster had a great return journey through Earth's atmosphere with successful operation of its onboard reaction control thrusters to correct the stage's return trajectory. Falling fast, the first stage hit peak speeds of about eight times the speed of sound and some intensely high temperatures from atmospheric drag. Having survived that hard and fast journey, we had successful deployment of the first stage's two parachutes to help slow Electron down to just 10 metres per second. Electron has since successfully splashed down and our team are deep in recovery mode to pull that booster out of the water and up on deck. Once it is on board, they'll desalt the vehicle as much as they can to preserve the stage for its trip home to land and to the factory. Right now, though, we are just seconds away from Curie engine shutdown on Electron's kick stage and the beginning of the payload deployment process. Curie engine cutoff confirmed. Apogee at 531.2 kilometers, Perigee at 529.8 kilometers and an inclination of 97.490 degrees. Good comms from Mission Control there. That carry engine has shut down ahead of payload deployment in the next 30 seconds. Payload 1 and payload 2 deployment confirmed. There we go. The first two of four lemur satellites have been deployed from the kick stage. Let's keep a close ear out for the second deployment milestone, sending the last two satellites for this mission off to work in LEO. Payload 3 and payload 4 deployment confirmed. That was Mission Control with the good news. We have successfully deployed all four of SPY and North Star satellites to orbit. And with that, we have completed the primary mission for our 43rd Electron launch. Rocket Lab's also been experimenting with using helicopters to try and catch these boosters on their way down while they're still in the air. But that's proving to be far more difficult than they thought. This is Space Time. And time now for another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study claims that men who improve their fitness could be reducing their risk of getting prostate cancer. 
The findings, reported in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, looked at the incidence of prostate cancer in a group of 57,652 men whose cardiorespiratory fitness had been tested using a stationary cycle at least twice over an average follow-up of nearly seven years. The authors found those whose fitness had improved by 3% or more per year were 35% less likely to develop prostate cancer than those whose fitness declined over time. Right now, there's little research on how one's fitness over time impacts one's risk of prostate cancer. And while this study was purely observational and therefore can't prove that fitness levels cause or change prostate cancer risk, the researchers said that their results at least suggest that working on your fitness could help improve your odds. Anyway, it certainly couldn't hurt. Scientists have produced the most comprehensive and complete cat genome assembly ever achieved, in the process providing fundamental information on the feline blueprint. The detailed DNA sequence, which has been reported in the journal Nature, highlights distinct genetic changes and will be a crucial tool for researchers investigating feline diseases and characteristics. Interestingly, the study identified fewer segmental duplications, that is, duplicated blocks of genomic DNA, in cats compared to other mammal groups. These insights are crucial for those studying feline diseases, behaviour and conservation. A new study has found that small dog breeds, such as Chihuahuas and Pomeranians, are likely to have less risk of developing cancer than bigger breeds. The findings reported in the Journal of the Royal Society Open Science found that larger breeds tend to have higher cancer risks, although the risk drops in the largest breeds because they tend to have shorter lifespans and so simply may not be living long enough to develop cancer. The study also found that some dog breeds, such as the flat-coated retriever, the Scottish terrier, Burmese mountain dogs and the bull mastiff, had cancer risks above what you'd expect for a breed of their size. Interestingly, the study also found that inbreeding was shown to shorten dogs' lifespans, but in general did not increase the cancer risk. Elon Musk has confirmed that his Neuralink company has for the first time successfully implanted a computer-human interface chip into the brain of a human volunteer. The US Food and Drug Administration gave permission for the company to undertake the procedure for what's called a wireless brain computer interface in order to evaluate both the safety of the implant and the procedure, which uses a surgical robot. The study will assess the functionality of the interface, which enables people with quadriplegia or paralysis of all four limbs to control a computer cursor or keyboard with just their thoughts. The implant's ultra-fine threads help transmit signals in the participant's brain. The unique procedure uses a robot to surgically implant the brain-computer interface into a region of the brain which controls the intention to move. Musk says the initial results show promising neuron spike detection. Spikes are activities in neurons, the cells which use electrical and chemical signals to send information around the brain and throughout the body. With the details, we're joined by technology editor Alex Saharov Royt from Tech Advice Start Life. Neuralink is his company that is creating a robotically implanted brain control interface, and it's very precisely implanted into the brain. And Elon Musk was implanting these implants into chimpanzees before there was a scandal where one of them died. But originally, this was designed for people who are quadriplegic, paraplegic, have some sort of injuries that, that come with their limbs. And this will give them effectively the ability to use the force. They can type things, they can control mobile phones, they can control devices. And uh, for somebody who's locked in syndrome or you know needs this sort of technology, it's obviously going to be a real lifesaver. Now, will people misuse it and want to do what Bradley Cooper did in the movie Limitless? and take some sort of uh, a drug, in this case it's an implantable piece of technology, that will improve their uh, dexterity and their memory and their processing power. But in the future, all of that will be the bionic man, the cyber man, you know, uh, Steve the Austin. transhumanism. <laughs> yeah, but also the transhumanism movement where every human will be connected and connected to some sort of hive mind. I mean, all of that is possible. Obviously, we don't want any of the bad things that uh, that could entail. We are the Borg. Resistance is futile. At the moment, of course, it's just for those people who can't be helped in any other way. And the news is that the very first human implanted device has successfully taken place. Look, I'm sure there's going to be more of these sorts of trials, more results. We will see people on stage who will be you know, thinking or controlling devices just with the power of thought alone. 
And it's interesting to think that, you know, humankind has had the concept of telekinesis. And of course, we have the idea of the force. And most kids would have, you know, tried reaching out to the force. I know when I was watching Star Wars, I tried to reach out. I to may make have done it too, you know. Yes. Unfortunately, nothing ever nothing happened, happened, ever. No. no. These aren't the droids you're looking for. It's a really quite annoying shame that one day this may be something that technology allows you to do. Look, the idea of humans merging with technology has been around for millennia, I guess. It's been happening slowly over the last 50 years, and uh, this is just the next step. It is, and plenty of people have pacemakers. So, look, this is still nascent technology. It's very early days yet. We only have the official word from Elon Musk that this first implant has been successful. There's still years, decades of development to come, but one day getting a chip in your brain or body may become utterly routine and we may not even think twice about it. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from Tech Advice. Start live. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 